on this episode of AHA, a day at Tanglewood. Among outdoor venues around the world, it's certainly one of the most successful that I've heard. A symphony's new direction. When we get closer and closer emotionally, you can perform anything because you trust each other. Cultural issues are addressed in a new and musical way. When they hear us play, it's like, wow, like, I never expected that sound. Expressing the power of music through paint. And I love the whole idea behind the symphony that, you know, it was a person walking through an exhibition. A European cellist delights American audiences. What I try to do in my performances is make the audience, first of all, understand the piece, especially if they haven't heard it before. It's all ahead on this episode of AHA! Funding for AHA has been provided by your contribution and by contributions to the WMHT Venture Fund. Contributors include the Leo Cox Beach Philanthropic Foundation, Chet and Karen Opalka, Robert and Doris Fisher Malsardi, and the Robeson Family Foundation. At m and Bank, we understand that the vitality of our communities is crucial to our continued success. That is why we take an active role in our community. m and is pleased to support WMHT programming that highlights the arts, and we invite you to do the same. Hi, I'm Katie G, and this is AHA, a house for arts, a place for all things creative. On August 4th, 1938, the Boston Symphony Orchestra gave its first concert in the Berkshires at a newly built open air shed. The location was Tanglewood, a sprawling estate that now draws over 350,000 visitors annually with its gorgeous views and stunning music. We visit Tanglewood to learn more about this incredible summer destination that has enchanted music lovers for over 75 years. The Tanglewood Festival as we know it today was really born over the summer, winter, summer of 1936 to 1937. The Boston Symphony had been invited by a group of fairly well-heeled New Yorkers to come and play a few concerts in a small festival that they'd started here for entertainment during the summer months. They came, they liked it. Sometime in the course of that winter, it was agreed that the property owned by the Tappan family called Tanglewood and named after the, the novel by Nathaniel Hawthorne would be donated to the Berkshire Symphonic Festival and to the BSO. And so in summer of 37, the orchestra came here to its then new home, uh, played a concert just over there on the lawn under a big tent. And we've been here basically ever since. That first summer was a little disastrous. The weather was terrible. The lightning was so loud that they had to stop the performance. There was fear that the tent would collapse. And so in the course of the evening, it was, it was decreed that there needed to be a permanent structure. And somehow, miraculously, between the summer of 37 and 38, this structure where we are now, which is now called the Kuzovitsky Music Shed, was constructed and every summer since we've been here playing concerts. Originally this was a very simple structure. As you see, a roof, a fan shape, with seating for about 5,000. And in the early years, there was a, a sort of music shell that sat in the middle of the, the stage. The orchestra played there. By all accounts, it was far from adequate acoustically. So sometime in the late 50s, um, a group of Boston acousticians decided they would try and improve the sound and created 
the canopy, the acoustic canopy, which sits over the orchestra, and a series of baffles here along the back wall of the shed. And these make an incredible sound. Tanglewood is a beautiful place in the Berkshire Hills of Massachusetts in the United States of America. Musicians go there to study and each summer there is a music festival. The originator of the Boston Symphony, Henry Lee Higginson, when he was founding the orchestra, had a conception that the orchestra should somehow include what he called a good, honest school for young musicians. That there would be somehow a transferal of skills, knowledge from the experienced musicians of the Boston Symphony to the next generation. This ideal was eventually realized in 1940 when then music director Serge Kuzovitsky, who is credited for having founded Tanglewood, decided that he wanted to create such a school here in the Berkshires on this property and created what's now called the Tanglewood Music Center. Here, each summer, the most promising students from many countries gather to perfect their work under the guidance of well-known musicians. Student composers of talent are encouraged and stimulated by fine instructors like Leonard Bernstein and Aaron Copeland. Don't you think the melodic material is a little ordinary there? Perhaps you could improve it over here. Over here too? Yes, I think over there also. In the very first class of the Tanglewood Music Center, uh, there was a very bright young chap by the name of Leonard Bernstein, uh, who of course became um, arguably the greatest American conductor of the 20th century, one of the most influential figures on our, our musical landscape. Uh, subsequently, uh, Seisho Zawa, who was the music director here, some other famous conductors, including Claudio Abbado, Christoph von Dochnani, the list goes on and on. But far more important and far more impressive are just the number of musicians who have come through and had training here at Tanglewood, who've joined the ranks of great symphony orchestras and about 30%, we, we figure, about 30% of the musicians in current U.S. orchestras spent at least one summer here at Tanglewood. So the fellows of the Tanglewood Music Center have taken their ranks not only in the great orchestras of our country, of the world, but on the opera stages. Their music is played and performed by many of the great soloists. It's been a very, very important uh, crucible for study and learning. I'm from Austin, Texas originally. I live in Oklahoma City. I am a vocal fellow at the Tanglewood program, having a great summer here singing and working with a lot of amazing professionals. I've grown and learned so much from my time at Tanglewood. Um, I came really in my uh, journey as a musician holding on to this idea of perfection being the goal. Through my time studying and learning and um, just growing from master classes and watching performances, I've learned so many things like how to listen and how to truly desire for the goal to be changed from musical perfection to a spiritual connection with myself, with the audience, and with the composer. So it's been an incredible transformation, and I'm looking forward to what that will look like going forward from here.
John Williams has been coming to Tanglewood for 38 years. What he always says about Tanglewood is it's the spiritual home of music in North America. He's written a lot of music here, the Harry Potter movies, you know, some of the Star Wars, some of the Close Encounters, uh, the Raiders, you know, bits and pieces of those were, were, were written here. He's, he's part of the, the fabric, part of the soul of, of, of Tanglewood himself. Among outdoor venues, I think it's uh, around the world, it's certainly one of the most successful that I've, I've heard. Somehow the combination of nature, of the air, of the sunshine, of the energy of the students, of the enthusiasm of the audiences, of the, the sheer beauty of this setting, uh, makes listening to just about anything more special than one can imagine. The reign of Andres Nelsons at the Boston Symphony Orchestra is now underway as the young conductor presided over a concert built very much around his identity. Jared Bowen spoke with Nelsons about the concert and his plans for the world-class orchestra. This was how Andres Nelsons introduced himself in his inaugural concert as the Boston Symphony Orchestra's new music director. It was Wagner's overture to Tannhauser, the piece he first heard as a five-year-old in his native Latvia that would inspire his musical life. It was a gala concert with performances by Nelson's friend, tenor Jonas Kaufman, an undeniable rock star in the opera world. Also appearing was renowned soprano Christina Opalais, who also happens to be Mrs. Nelson's. And this is how the conductor ended the evening, with Respighi's rousing and showy Pines of Rome, flooding the hall with its bombastic energy and a signal that a much different era has begun. The final notes played, the hoopla subsided. Now Nelson's must get to work, he told me earlier this fall, from his room near the Symphony Hall stage. Now it's in a way, I can breathe, but I, 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 I enjoy and we, we, start, we start working. You know. Spend time watching Nelson's from his giant smile in concert to his impassioned responses in rehearsal, and you quickly understand this is a man rooted in emotion. As a listener, even as a musician in the conducting, you simply just can't, you, you want to cry, and you, you simply have the tears when you see, uh, you know, the, this beautiful music, when you hear this beautiful music. It's a now period when we get closer and closer emotionally and humanly, and as soon as, as you got close, close, you can perform anything and you can improvise or you can because you trust each other. So you are constant pulse. One, two, three. For me, it's, it's, it's not enough to play just the notes. We, we have much bigger responsibility. It is really to create, to create um, you know, the, the story, to create the drama, to create uh, something special in the concert. It sounds it, like your heart is more with tradition. Well, no, I mean, my heart is with, with uh, my heart is with, um, with combining these things and not dividing, oh, that is, that is old-fashioned music, that is a contemporary music. For me, I would say, if it's important that any composer in any century wants to express, the, the, there is a reason why he has composed the piece, and the reason comes from the heart. Much, it seems, as Nelson's himself.
Next, we see how two brothers in Syracuse, New York, work together to send an important message. A cellist and violinist, the McGriff twins use dedication and passion to create musical and cultural harmony. For a while, cello was just something I did. Our teacher opened us up to a whole new style of music. It was more about feeling the music. She taught us to listen and to feel the music rather than in working on the traditional, you know, scales. You see a cello and violin and it automatically people think classical music. And then when they hear us play, it's like, wow, like I never expected that sound. It's more of a play that back. Like we'll just be playing together and then Eric, like one time we had a performance and um, 15 minutes before the performance, we were just playing something Eric was like, hold up, play that back again. And it turned into like this whole like new hip hop thing. And it's more of like we play together and then we try out new sounds and he'll he knows how I play, I know how he plays. So I'll be like, do that thing that you do. And he'll tell me and then it, we just work off each other like that. We've played together for so long, and then the fact that we're we're also brothers, like there's there's obviously a connection. Like I can tell just by the order of notes how that he plays what he's gonna do next, and just by looking at him, his body movements and stuff like that, we can tell each other. Like especially like having a conversation while we're playing our instrument. <laughs> We both go to school at Syracuse. I'm majoring in political science, I'm on the pre-law track. And I'm political philosophy and women's and gender studies. We went on to be uh, chairman of our house, student chairman of our house, and a lot of work we do, um, we work to redefine masculinity and put an end to sexual and domestic violence. We work to raise awareness and teach others to develop a capacity to switch perspectives, put yourself in somebody else's shoes, and then maybe we can work forward and make some progress and work together for a better community. facilitating conversations with the kids, getting to you know the, the root of the violence, where it begins structurally, what kind of language, what kind of messages that they're introduced to, and how they're going to you know, shape their personalities. We do use our music like with the local domestic violence shelter, Vera House. We perform at their things. We perform for the Clean Slate Diaries, which is like a art show and um, an awareness event about you know, survivors of domestic violence and sexual abuse. So we use them together. I encourage that. It's always a good thing to release that. And, and you can see it too. You can see it in the eyes. Like you can see it when they lose themselves in the music. When the music becomes so much more than the notes on the page and they just take it to a place that just transcends. And that, you know, that it's sort of like a spiritual relief, and when you see that in someone's eyes, you know that music is doing something for them. Written in 1874, the famed piano composition Pictures at an Exhibition was Russian composer Modest Mazorsky's musical expression of a collection of artwork. Now the Copley Society of Art in Boston, Massachusetts reverses the concept. In advance of a series of performances of pictures by the Boston Symphony Orchestra, the Copley Society asked artists to paint works based on the music. Get an inside look at how they compose their impressions. I think it's a great collaboration. I mean, I love the whole idea behind the symphony that you know it was a person walking through an exhibition. The music came inspired by art, and so we're flipping it around and do and creating art inspired by the music. This painting is based on a particular piece within the pictures in an exhibition. Uh, called the Garden of the Tuileries. It's very jagged. There's a lot of arpeggios and uh, a lot of color, a lot of action. Well, 
I grew up with Russian music. Russian music is very evocative. It's rooted in spiritual and uh, fairy tales, and the music uh, has the kind of scurrying uh, quality uh, to it that uh, I visualize like this. The particular promenade that I chose, the turmoil, I thought roiling surf. When waves are crashing on the shore, there's a surge, there's a buildup, and then there's an explosion on the shore. And that same thing sort of happens in music. You have this composition that repeats, there's a variation on a theme. What the Copley Society has done is groundbreaking for today's art world, um, but at the same time, it's really revisiting the history of what it means to communicate as an artist, and I'm very happy to be part of it. In our final segment, we meet a Polish emigre who arrives stateside with an incredible gift. Having risen to the prestigious role of principal cellist for the Baltimore Symphony, the musician wows American audiences each time he plays. And that wraps it up for this edition of AHA. For more arts and culture, visit WMHT.org slash AHA, where you'll find features about our creative world in our backyards and across the country. Until next time, I'm Katie G. Thanks for watching.
Funding for AHA has been provided by your contribution and by contributions to the WMHT Venture Fund. Contributors include the Leo Cox Beach Philanthropic Foundation, Chet and Karen Opalka, Robert and Doris Fisher Malsardi, and the Robeson Family Foundation. At MT Bank, we understand that the vitality of our communities is crucial to our continued success. That is why we take an active role in our community. MT is pleased to support WMHT programming that highlights the arts, and we invite you to do the same.